Hello all, and Happy New Year. For this video, we're going to be going over general concepts and looking deeper into the 19th century empiricist tradition. Um, but of course, we wanted to look at Bertrand Russell in particular. And so if we we're going to build off of the last video, I wanted to look at the deductive method in science in depth. Uh, which, of course, is a hand down from the objectivity, really, that the Enlightenment with Locke and Hobbes with their premise and definitions towards uh, deducing um, and, um, you know, using a uh, chain of, of logic towards uh, a conclusion. And um, you can see that the scientific method is... Um, really, you know, in a way, going uh, about foundationalism with Descartes and, you know, intuition and, um, you know, putting it more into an empirical lens of, uh, you know, using uh, hypotheticals and generalizations as Locke and Hobbes did for uh, a different sort of foundationalism or um, you know, a different um, um, a difference, if you will, from speculative metaphysics. And so what really this is going to be as a consequence for uh, the social sciences as we regarded last time is that this is using hypotheticals and scientific, scientific generalizations um, and uh, formalizing it into a system that can then be an extension out from uh, mathematical deduction towards human science or logic itself and a sort of philosophy of life uh, to some degree. And so 19th century generalizations, um, you know, they don't have the same uh, rubric, if you will, for, um, you know, proving something in that sense but instead it is you know, brought about in a hypothetical or a hypothesis that you generalize out of um, in the scientific method. Um, and so deduction, which was allowed under Mill, um, out of that grand uniformity of nature, this sort of naturalism uh, within science. Um, and so the grand uniformity of nature is of course the highest generalization as we saw with uh, Conti and um, Mill. And so natural science then, turning by extension or premises, uh, goes into the social sciences or the unity of science, as uh, Conti said. Uh, and so it's interesting to ha perhaps, if we turn to Russell himself, to see you know, how he you know, messes with that age um, old dichotomy of, you know, the phenomenalist and um, the realist. And so he wants to take empirical science and suggested that, uh, you know, you can outgrow metaphysics just like with uh, Conti uh, toward a phenomenalist uh, point of view. So, of course, with Russell, though, in the influential uh, discussion, um, Bertrand Russell will be, you know, massively influential for the likes of logical positivism, early Wittgenstein, um, and analytic philosophy that comes in the century following him. And so, as we accounted for above, we're taking a scientific naturalism and influence uh, until mid-century, really, uh, from this empiricism. And so one of the works that you could actually really pin this down on is his collaboration with Whitehead, if you looked at my Whitehead videos. Um, and this was, of course, with the uh, Principia Mathematica, which is to take, of course, the formalization of mathematics as the same as the logic, uh, as they are both, you know, going about a formal system or deduction and so this births, um, you know, symbolism really in the English uh, uh, philosophy sphere, 
of algebraic symbols used in a formal way of um, you know, setting symbolic logic forward. And so if you looked at his problems of philosophy, which is of course his inquiry into epistemology in general, he um, you know, wants to deal with the mind and matter dichotomy um, and also look at the human scope of knowledge and its limits uh, throughout the 40s. So if we're going to hone in on epistemology, his epistemology is a formal system or deductive system of logic as the essence of philosophy. This is commonly regarded among uh, people who are uh, read on Bertrand Russell as logical atomism. And so what is logical atomism though? is the you know smallest measurement possible on thoughts and beliefs uh, within human knowledge um, analyzed in a sort of uh, atomic proposition which we'll get into with um, atomic propositions really asserting or denying uh, something in proposition it's the smallest unit of uh, thought with the atomic fact um, it's an atomistic uh, view of you know sense data really coming in these you know bare smallest uh, facts which I think is uh, what he gets from Mox uh, constitution of experience from the smallest units of economical ways of analyzing atomic data or sense data <clears throat> and so you use these atomic facts to form molecular propositions which of course is a a synthesis or a combination of those atomic facts, those smallest uh, um, realizations of, of, of reality or uh, sense data, if you will. And so, of course, if we're going to turn to the, the terms themselves, which is very important for Russell, um, they're the general characteristics or properties, such as color and shape, or in how they name um, you know, particular individuals themselves. Um, and so you have the organization of atomic propositions which constitutes into certain premises from those generalizations. Uh, and therefore you can, you know, hypothesize or, you know, go to the utmost of such uh, general propositions. So these logical explanations are beliefs that can be deduced logically from those generalizations or hypotheticals. So his foundational model, uh, which goes into ethics or any subject matter of you know, really anything, is what he would argue, uh, you know, comes from mathematics, such as the Principia uh, Mathematica uh, for all logical explanation. And so the relationships of atomic facts uh, don't bring about from experience without a causal connection. So it gets a little murky because Russell goes through these transformations in, in thought with, you know, is there a way to empirically know, you know, these causal relationships uh, to really still maintain his realism or is he going to be a phenomenalist? And so depending on where you're at in his career, you'll get a different answer. And so Russell, um, you know, he's looking at organic relationships um, in a sort of plural sense of um, rejecting really when it comes to human knowledge um, uh, of having a, a Bergson or, or um, Bradley, um, you know, appearance of, of seeing an entire scene uh, out of the, you know, grand world picture is how you ultimately get uh, a worldview. Um, he's going for a more pluralistic approach, but nonetheless, though, he has a sort of monistic characteristic towards um, the mind-body uh, Descartes notion. And so he's really breaking up that there's no, you know, two separate entities here. Uh, but only one property uh, with neutrality towards the dichotomy of the two. And so atomism attempts to find the basic facts that constitute reality and anticipates uh, the causal relationships. 
And so he's taking, you know, despite having foundations himself, himself, he is, uh, you know, going into a more phenomenalist view of these causal ways in which objects interact with each other are our actual own making uh, within our own mental uh, constructs or construction, um, as we'll get into. So he has that phenomenalist view of knowledge of causal relationships. If you don't know causal relationships, then how can atomic data have external cause? And so when he accepts causal relationships, then he slips you know, into that realistic or real ob material objects and knowledge of their causal properties within the scientific method. Uh, but that's really it. Uh, beyond that, he is, you know, much more into, um, you know, the phenomenalist uh, perception. And so Russell takes uh, you know, conscious intentionality uh, as the mental process that gives onto me or the phenomenalist view of uh, that object. Whereas, of course, with later Russell, he comes to, you know, reject that, you know, we have this empirical notion of causal relationships and uh, the mental act is the mental process or act, um, um, you know, uh, able to really uh, be seen in this sort of empirical way of, of knowing that. Um, but if we were going to go on with more terms here, um, his atomic proposition, which is important toward uh, the constituents of language, so we have to analyze the prior molecular propositions to get to atomic propositions. Molecular propositions combines two things into the symbolic form, such as an existent individual who has certain characteristics, such as, you know, I have a beard right now. Um, whereas, if we were going to look at his epistemology of the correspondence theory of truth, He's much more concise with the one-to-one -one correlation for uh, an atomic proposition, an atomic fact, uh, within those terms and properties given. And so molecular propositions and complex ideas are mental constructs that we construct um, our objects out of. Atomic facts, however, or the sense data, is into that more realist dichotomy, the, the smallest, you know, facts or reality that uh, our sense data really, you know, rubs up against. Uh, you know, we take that in and then out of that we form our, you know, causal, mental, uh, constructive relationships. Um, because relationships aren't a given, we simply absorb those atomic facts and then out of that construct those relationships. So you can see, of course, that he, despite having, you know, the scientific method, uh, you know, empirical generalizations, um, he still has uh, that insight that, you know, the object is, you know, or these constructs are in my own making. And so he dips into the postmodern influence, of course, going on in the continent uh, by doing this. And as for, of course, uh, the deductive, which is you know, the second um, you know, bridge here, uh, it, it's more in depth when you look into his uh, human knowledge uh, scope and limit uh, in the late 40s. And so this book has an organization of the scope of scientific knowledge, how knowledge arises out of uh, the methods of, of science. Um, and so his way of dealing with, um, you know, uh, being able to generalize like this, uh, we have to introduce additional premises or scientific postulates. Um, and so these postulates, which are key to understand, um, really revolve around the principle of induction or the uniformity of nature, uh, causal lines, of course, which can be you know, drawn to see the cause and effects or influences, and of course the quasi-permanence of material objects as they appear. And so he's taking those prior metaphysical groundings that are uh, really just uh, taken on a speculative ground as, as, as a given, 
and trying to elevate uh, Hume's uh, use of necessary uh, connections because, of course, you know, Hume's skepticism of um, you know, knowing in an empirical way, uh, he would you know, much rather be inclined to put that into belief. Russell here is trying to introduce it into the scientific method in itself as these postulates. Um, and so scientific knowledge is justified or explained deduction from empirical generalizations. Um, and therefore we need these you know, postulates to be able to um, act upon scientific knowledge. And empir empiricism um, doesn't have a logical explanation uh, for this. And so you need to use these postulates in order to um, really, you know, just get away from just having a pure empirical way of understanding these things, because of course you, you, you know, you can't. You're generalizing. You're you're making hypothesis, um, and so that's necessary to be able to do the scientific method or have uh, the epistemology that Bertrand Russell is trying to introduce here. So yeah, this is just a brief overview and generalization of Bertrand Russell's thought throughout his career. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, again, Happy New Year. Um, and I look forward to uh, making more videos for you in 2023. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, and thanks for the support.